Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's edition, Kyle Bauer visits with Rex Friesen from Southern Kansas Cotton Growers. Cotton has become a growing trend. Learn what it takes to grow and harvest cotton in Kansas. Next up, Greg Akagi brings us the Kansas Soybean Update. Then Dwayne Taves talks with David Pugh, owner of Southern Tracks Veterinary Services. David talks about parasites in different regions of the state and how to recognize when they are an issue in your herd. Learn what's going on around the state with the Kansas Farm Bureau update. And to wrap up, it's Plain Talk with Kyle and Dwayne. It's all coming up on Farm Factor. Stay tuned. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Kansas Corn reminds you that E15 fuel is the right choice for every kind of driver. For the car enthusiast, E15 has higher octane. For the thrifty driver, E15 is priced lower than regular unleaded. For the nature lover, E15 provides cleaner air. For the shopper who buys local, E15 has more ethanol from our Kansas corn farms. Choose E15 for a higher octane, lower price, cleaner American fuel. Message from the Kansas Corn Commission. Learn more at kscorn.com. Okay, looks like it's time for our tour. Welcome to the Fort Wallace Museum. Here at the museum, you're gonna find some really interesting stuff like our replica stagecoach from the Butterfield Overland Dispatch. We've got facades from the fort buildings. And we've got an 1870s flag. There's a plesiosaur that was discovered locally. We've got the Ray pump organ collection. We're a little bit place with a great big story and we'd love to have you. Practical, profitable genetics. It's not just a slogan, but our expectation for every Dale Banks bull we market. They won't be a one-trait wonder, but they will offer optimum levels of the most predictable genetics in the industry today. They'll be developed on forage, backed by decades of data, fertility tested, foot scored, and freeze branded. We'll sell 150 yearling and coming two-year-old bulls in our practical, profitable genetics bull sale on Saturday, November 23rd at the ranch near Eureka, Kansas. For information, call the Perriers at 620-583-4305 or dalebanks.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome to Farm Factor. Kyle Bauer is with Rex Friesen with Southern Kansas Cotton Growers. A lot of people don't think about Kansas as being a cotton state, but certainly over the last uh, couple decades, it's become a cotton state. Rex, tell me about the company that you work with. I work with Southern Kansas Cotton Growers. We're a cotton cooperative that runs two gins, one at Anthony and one at Winfield. The, win, the gin at Winfield is the oldest gin and operating gin in Kansas right now. In 1996 it was built. And then the Anthony gin was a few years later, and I can't remember exactly when. Uh -huh. And then we also have two, uh, there's a, two other gins in Kansas also uh, out at Cullison, the next generation. And then Northwest count, uh, Cotton Growers out at Moscow, Kansas. I guess we'll just start through this on the growing cycle of cotton. When do you plant it? When do you harvest it? We try to plant it as soon as as soon as uh, weather lets us, and that's usually starting about Mother's Day. We start watching the weather and the forecast, uh, and we plant through the first week of June and maybe a little bit later, uh, depending again depending on the weather. Uh, cotton doesn't like to be cold, so that the roller coaster we have in May is often often dictates when we start. Well, cotton is relatively new to Kansas. Um, uh, certainly, it's just across the border in Oklahoma as well. But cotton is not a new crop. Why are we raising cotton in Kansas now, and we haven't for centuries? I think a lot. There's a number of reasons for that. There's a lot uh, lack of familiarity. I think. Uh, People are just discovering it, and people are uh, farmers are looking for options, options that make some money. Mm -hmm. And cotton has had a really good run with our yields and prices, so our, our growers are very happy with the returns that they've been getting lately. But truly, it's not a lot like raising grain. Besides the uh, agronomic practices, uh, you don't just raise cotton and haul it to town. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be involved with cotton. That's correct. It's a lot more complicated in production. Management, in, it's more management intensive. Uh, 
harvesting. You need a special equipment for that. The, the harvesters are called strippers or pickers, and you can't use a combine for that. Uh, you need it to be harvested. You need it to be ginned before it's worth really much anything. So. Let's talk about the ginning process. That's how, how, who you work for. Uh, so after the farmer harvests it, what happens at the gin? Well, as the cotton is harvested in the field, the, the harvesters call in when fields are done and report how many bales or round bales they might have, modules or round bales. And then following that, we put them on the list of when we gin them and uh, when, when it's trucked and ginned. So we, we have it in an orderly fashion. We do our best to gin it in the order that it's called in. And uh, when it's their turn, we have it at the gin and we, we run it through the gin and gin it. But what happens at the, in the ginning process that makes the uh, cotton marketable? Well, we have to clean it. For one, there's often a lot of material, plant material in it. Um, and the most important thing is we got to take the seeds out. And that's where uh, it's a very unique process. And if you've heard the name Eli Whitney before, uh, I like to tell kids even when I give them demonstrations that we have to take the lint out, separate the lint from the seeds before we can do anything with the lint. And following that, we package, package it in bales and prepare it for sale. So after you prepare it, what happens to it from there? Well, what normally happens is the, the gin or the bales are ginned and they're tagged with a unique number. Everyone is graded separately and uniquely. And the, the quality rises and falls on each individual bale. But those bales, they're sent to a warehouse facility in Lib Liberal. And while the quality grades are determined, they're waiting there for that to be done. Once it's determined, then those grades are put in the computer. And every one of those bales then is ready for a sale to a textile mill wherever it may go. The ginning capacity or the milling capacity in, in the United States is only about three or four million bales. And we produce probably 20 to 22 million bales. The rest is all for export. Thanks, Kyle. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today, we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if your cattle get out, you could be held liable for that? Call me. Let's have a discussion. 316-945-6733. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. I had this horse, it was a good horse, except when the wind was blowing above 30 mile an hour. Wind was blowing about 35, 40, and I saddled him up, rode him out to the end of the lane, and I thought, well, he's doing pretty good. And about six jumps later, I was laying on the ground and thinking, boy, my shoulders sure hurt. I kept waiting, and it, it didn't get better, and so I went to an orthopedic surgeon, and that showed that I had torn rotator cuff. And said, well, I have to do surgery. I, I farm and ranch by myself. It's not going to work out very well. I'd been sleeping in my recliner for about two and a half years because it hurt too much to sleep in bed on my side. And I'd heard about Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center on the radio. Got down there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 11.30, the procedure was all over. They just took some fat out of my side here and spun that down for about 45 minutes, and then injected it in my shoulders, and I was on my way. It's something you don't hear about, but I thought it was worth a try, and I'm really pleased. It's, it's really worked out well for me. This segment brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Timothy Venverlo, Vice President of Sustainability Strategy with the United Soybean Board, joins us. Tim, a new study commissioned by the United Soybean Board, revealed the lack of access to broadband in rural areas and how big of a toll it takes on American farmers and the economy. You know, over 60% of these farmers 
do not have adequate connectivity. And ag represents about $133 billion to the U.S. GDP. When these farmers do not have access to the kind of technology that helps improve their performance, it is not only impacting our food supply, but also our GDP. What were some of the other significant findings that uh, you found in the study? The study found that 78% do not have another viable internet provider option. So that goes right to cost and performance. 60% are trying to work with very slow speeds, and only 32% consider that their office connection is reliable. And it's impacting newer technologies out there, devices and machinery that generate data, that talk between the devices, that finally transmit that data to the home office and even out into the Internet. Tim, did the survey indicate anything in particular that affected Kansas farmers? There were a few quotes from Kansas farmers that I found interesting. You know, they indicated they feared no or low connectivity would leave them behind as ag innovations increasingly include the Internet and high-speed broadband. What does broadband and Internet access have to do with sustainability? If we expect that our farmers produce more safe, reliable, sustainably grown food for our consumption, and we expect them to be a part of the climate solution by putting carbon back into the soil where it's healthy for the soil and healthy for our crops instead of in the air, then we have to give them the technology that allows them to make those kind of decisions and allows their equipment to participate in that high-speed exchange of information and data. Tim, how do you summarize this study as a whole? Basically, what we're talking about in this issue is an infrastructure problem or issue. These are highways. These are data highways. And farmers need access to these data highways and data roads. And they also want to create data, use data, and share data that helps and supports a very safe and reliable production of sustainably sourced soybeans in the case of the United Soybean Board. Again, produced not only for domestic purposes, but for food purposes all over the world. That was Timothy Venverlo, Vice President of Sustainability Strategy with the United Soybean Board, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Coming up, Dwayne Taves talks with David Pugh, owner of Southern Tracks Veterinary Services, about how to recognize and treat cattle parasites across the state. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yet we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'll be glad to answer it and work with you. Kansans have a new choice for Medicare Supplement Insurance Plans. With Medicare Supplement Insurance Plans from Kansas Farm Bureau, you have access to four levels of coverage, affordable rates, and service from an organization that served Kansans for more than 100 years. For more information on Kansas Farm Bureau Medicare Supplement Plans, including rates and to apply, visit kfbhealthplans.com. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now Dwayne is with David Pugh, owner of Southern Tracks Veterinary Services. Dwayne Tames joining you once again on Ag AM in Kansas and a chance to catch up with David Pugh with Southern Tracks uh, out of Alabama. David, uh, we think about uh, internal parasites uh, in beef cattle in particular uh, at this particular conference that we happen to attend. Uh, really, they are a, a profit robber, but uh, but you don't see it uh, because it's it's not visible. Yeah. Well, it, it, uh, parasitism um, in um, Alabama is ubiquitous everywhere. 
uh, here in Kansas, um, the diseases all, everywhere, internal parasite diseases, are local. They're like politics. And so parts of this state, you're going to have very, very few parasite problems. In other parts, you have a lot of, a lot of problems. Uh, in adult cows, it's the one that people talked about for years, years was Ostertasia. It's still there. Uh, more of a problem in certain areas. But in young calves, we have used uh, really, really good dewormers for a really long time. You know, we've had uh, Ivermex since the uh, late 70s. And, and uh, parasites um, literally adapt to improvise and overcome. They figure out how to beat the, the dewormer. So the more often you deworm, uh, the more uh, likely you are to see problems. And in our younger calves don't have good immunity yet uh, or have not accrued the immunity to Hamacus or Ostatagia. Those, I mean, Hamacus or Cupira, those two parasites are really robbers of potential growth and feed efficiency. Um, uh, in, in animals that are inappropriately dewormed. Is that fair? So talk about a little bit of how we uh, uh, avoid those situations where we have some of those uh, parasites that, uh, that are developing resistance. What does a producer do to try to uh, evade that problem? Well, one is don't, don't just deworm unless you have a, if you don't have a problem, you would minimize your deworming. We, even in Southeast, we recommend in adult cows not deworming uh, um, cattle with, on a one to nine body condition score if they're over four years of age uh, and over five conditions we don't recommend deworming them unless they got ear in them if they got a little brahma in them they're going to have parasite problems because they're genetically uh, superior for external parasites but inferior for internal parasites and so we're going to recommend uh, not deworming everybody but just the one it needs so lower than five body condition score on, an, on anything over four years of age uh, would be need to be dewormed. Uh, all calves up to probably a year and a half, sometimes two years of old, uh, should be dewormed. And it depends on once a year or twice a year. And, and I would get something that would control specifically Hamacus and Ostertasia. And right now, where I live in Alabama, and I would bet a Coca-Cola is similar here, uh, although less of a problem here, that's going to be a white wormer. And you've got three choices. There. You've got a Panicure Safeguard, um, uh, Val Basin, uh, which is uh, made by um, Zoetis, and um, a Synatic. And those are real similar dewormers. That, those will control, most of the time, those two parasites in younger calves. And then the other one of the macrocytic lactones, there's two sides of that family. And I think a lot of companies argue about it, but you go to real parasitologists and they're going to say, no, there's two sides. There's an abomectoside and an avermectoside. And the avermectoside right now, where I live, has poor efficacy against Cupira and and, Ostertate, uh, and um, Hamacus. So we're going to pick some out of abomectoside. And right now that's sidectin. And uh, so epinectin, uh, dectamax, and, um, and ivermectin are less good choices for young calf deworming where I live. We're talking about uh, the situation, uh, a lot of humidity, a lot of wet grass. Mm -hmm. uh, we had more of that this year in Kansas than we've ever had with the kind of moisture and rainfall that we had early on and in pasture settings. Likely has set some of those calves up for a, a fairly high incidence of infection. Yeah, well, a couple ways you could check is to do fecal flotations. Uh, another is you go with body condition score and just deworm. But I, most of my calves in scenarios where we've had um, humidity and, and good grass growth and some, some um, uh, temperatures that are conducive for parasitism, I'm going to deworm all my young weanling calves. Um, I'm going to pick something again that'll, that would control those two specific parasites. And I'd, I'd work closely with my local veterinarian. I'd work closely with my diagnostic lab. Yeah, I got a great diagnostic lab system here in, in Kansas, you know, at Kansas State, and a phenomenal one. And, and you got good parasitologists. And so I'd work with all those people and the cooperative extension service, uh, Dr. Topoff, who I've met. Um, those people together, he's free. And those people together would build me a program and try to aim my dewormer that is effective against the parasites that would be cause the most. Um, uh, weight loss and poor gain uh, in younger animals. I'd aim my dewormer at that. In other words, I wouldn't just carte blanche use a cheap dewormer. I wouldn't base my dewormer program because of price, because that's, that doesn't make sense. You want to get something that will meet the deworm, that will meet the parasite and kill him dead. You don't want to live in harmony with him. I want to kill them all if I can, and um, that's, that's the way I work. Our thanks to David Pugh joining us here on Ag AM in Kansas. Jamie, we'll send it back to you.
Thanks, Dwayne. Come back after the break for this week's Kansas Farm Bureau update. Kim Mannering with Hardy Insurance. Today we will talk about umbrella coverage. Did you know that if your cattle get out, you could be held liable for that? Call me. Let's have a discussion. 316-945-6733. What if U.S. soybean meal were more than a commodity? If seed companies and the soybean checkoff built a better variety? That future is here. The time is now. To meet end-user demands, the soybean checkoff is investing in the compositional quality of soybeans, including meal. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Farm Bureau update. Resolutions Committee um, gave me a new purpose, I guess a new drive, um, a, a way to get involved at the state level and so I'm excited to be on, on the Resolutions Committee. This is my second year um, of the three year stint. Serving on Resolutions Committee, we're getting um, a, a wide spectrum of, of issues all across the state. Um, for example, water, um, and even me as a, as a producer, I'm a dryland farmer, um, I've learned a lot uh, about uh, irrigation and, and the water issues all across the state. And so yeah, you're trying to, um, to represent those, those issues and to, to learn about them. Uh, and we, part of the Resolutions Committee, we, we have a lot of education and, and uh, that they, they try to bring to us so that we can try to make educated decisions um, moving forward in the policy discussion. I live in Sedgwick County and, and so farming in Sedgwick County is, is, is a lot different than um, farming in, in Elk County and so I represent, you know, District 4, I represent a lot of variety in our, in our counties within that district. Um, yes, in Sedgwick County there's a, a lot of um, urban sprawl issues and uh, I, educating um, the members within that district. Um, and not just members, but just uh, people in the community. Um, Sedgwick County, um, they, they don't understand what farmers do. And so we're trying to um, reach that. And when I served on the county board, I um, was able to do that more and help to educate people within Sedgwick County. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break with Plain Talk. Kansans have a new choice for Medicare supplement insurance plans. With Medicare Supplement Insurance Plans from Kansas Farm Bureau, you have access to four levels of coverage, affordable rates, and service from an organization that served Kansans for more than 100 years. For more information on Kansas Farm Bureau Medicare Supplement Plans, including rates and to apply, visit kfbhealthplans.com. This segment brought to you by Santa Fe Trail Meets in Overbrook. Let us help feed your family. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are up to on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk. And with the fella who always says, speak <laughs> your mind and ride a fast horse. <laughs> well, you always say it, but it's like I never listen to you. Yeah. Speak your mind and ride a fast horse, Dwayne Allen Taves. Talk the to, wonder to, of Mound Ridge, Kansas. Talk low, talk slow, and carry a big stick. I I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Besides that, when you speak low and you speak slow, when you do talk, people, people listen. listen. Yeah, like, it's not like us radio people who talk <laughs> constantly. They're just babbling on. Don't have to nothing. Be, you don't have to be E.F. Hutton. <laughs> you can be just an average person. Average person. Talk low, talk slow, and, and people will listen. They'll either listen or they'll wonder whether or not your brain's in first gear. Yeah, or they won't, and then you can say, I told you so. Speaking That's of like brains, go ahead. your fact or fiction question of the day, ants outweigh humans on the earth. Fact or fiction. You know, I have heard that. I cannot believe. Wait a minute. I think it's maybe insects. Ants. Yeah, I think it's insects. I'm going with fiction. It says it's true. There's more ants more by pounds, weight. biomass, weight. Do you believe ants. that? Well, there's lots of ants in lots of places, but there's lots of people in lots of places too. Yeah, and just think how many ants it would take to make up 
a person. Although, have you seen some of those where they'll find an ant colony and they'll pour yeah, molten aluminum, aluminum in down it? it? Right. Which, yeah. which that, you know, for the ant, that ain't such a good deal. Well, no, it, it's not a big. <laughs> it's not hard at all because they send them an eviction notice. Oh, they put um, a little note and out there's front. There's a legal notice that they yeah. have. They send them and they hey, say, you know, we're going to be doing this on this date. <laughs> two so. weeks. Yeah, better be you out of be here. Moved out, so and then and then everything's fine. Okay. So, well, yeah. with a name like Bauer, I'm of German descent. Yeah. Okay, and there's about 320 million people in the United States. All right. Okay. What What are the number of people that claim a German descent in the United States? Oh. Because we're coming through October, Oktoberfest. You know, uh, big sauerkraut, sauerkraut ball season. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, time out. And so what? Sauerkraut balls? You've never had sauerkraut balls? No. Well, you're and not I, German. I claim to be half. Well, the yeah. other half's Irish. Well, actually, I'm half, only half too. Yeah. But um, the German but, side's but, the but fun side. But it's always been more prominent. Yeah, exactly. No, you've never had sauerkraut balls? I have not. Well, I don't I've know had how many of these people. a number of ways, but never in a ball. Well, you mix it with... Um, a little bit of ground meat and a sauce, which I assume is probably mushroom soup. Uh, uh-huh. Mix them all up. Make a little ball, and then you bread it and deep fry it. Really? Yeah. You got to be careful when you bite into that, though. A little warm on the inside? Gee, it could be hot. Huh. Yeah. yeah, and you know how— I feel so cheated. Well, Maybe yeah. I'll run into somebody that makes those Well, sometime. do you eat sauerkraut at all? Yes. Okay, well, you could make your own. I'm really not that ambitious. You know ambitious. what? For the man party next year, we should make sauerkraut, <laughs> sauerkraut balls. Sauerkraut balls? That's right. That would be... That ought to make a few people stay away. To, oh, I eat sauerkraut on Polish sausage. Uh-huh. Eat sauerkraut just loose with ring sausage in it. Yeah. Oh, I do too. I'm a... I'm... I'm... Eat sauerkraut whenever I remember to buy it. Have you ever it, made I sauerkraut? I you my wife will not buy it. Ha- no, have you made no. it? My mom used to make turnip kraut. Oh, really? Which was the same way as sauerkraut, only, I mean, she'd shred up the turnips this time of year and put it in the big crock in the basement with the brine over it, put a plate on top of it, as I recall. We had a wooden cover, but we'll keep talking. And then it sits down there and rots for a while. (laughs) Pretty (laughs) pretty much. And when it's done rotting, then you take it out. You drain it it. off and (laughs) eat it. (laughs) My, isn't that tasty. Isn't that something? Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Practical, profitable genetics. It's not just a slogan, but our expectation for every Dale Banks bull we market. They won't be a one-trait wonder, but they will offer optimum levels of the most predictable genetics in the industry today. They'll be developed on forage, backed by decades of data, fertility tested, foot scored, and freeze branded. We'll sell 150 yearling and coming two-year-old bulls in our practical, profitable genetics bull sale on Saturday, November 23rd at the ranch near Eureka, Kansas. For information, call the Perriers at 620-583-4305 or dalebanks.com.